Politicians love things like malls or even in a smaller town like a Walmart opening because that's a big ribbon cutting. Imagine your local mall today. How empty has it become? How many bored people are walking in discounted stores with only a few mall walkers left to visit them? How did it get this way? To understand where dead malls come from, we have to go back to the end of World War II. We're coming out of the war, which is this massive government-led effort. But also what you have going on after the war is the federal government's heavily subsidizing the suburbanization of America. That's Nolan Gray. So they're insuring mortgages for GIs, general population, so people are going out and buying these new suburban kind of Levittown homes starting families. At the same time, there's this huge highway construction boom, so we're building highways to make it really easy to live way far out of cities. Modern urban planners reimagined American life around a new suburban ideal. Single family houses driving individual cars down the freeway to parts of the city zoned for segregated uses. While the invention of the car would have spurred this change in American life regardless, the government reinforced that. Regulation came in, which essentially enforced this auto-oriented lifestyle. We're going to segregate uses. You're not going to have a corner grocery anymore. You're going to have a supermarket, which could be five to ten miles across town. And there's going to be all the other shops that you want to go to over there. You're going to have to have parking associated with every new housing unit, with every new store, with every new office space. And everything's going to be kept separate, and you're going to drive from one place to another. The American Mall exemplifies this plan a destination for car drivers and families who live in homes that are spread out. But concentrating retail wasn't just a convenience for shoppers. It helps local governments tax and regulate. And that demonstrates a political angle to many malls that often gets lost in its shiny newness. Politicians love things like malls or even in a smaller town like a Walmart opening because that's a big ribbon cutting. And I can go to my constituents and say, hey, this big new store opened, you've been there, it smells good, it's shiny, it's clean, you can buy things you couldn't buy before. There's no equivalent with, hey, the Main Street that's been around for decades, it didn't close this year, so you're welcome, right? There's no equivalent. Malls are this big obvious sign that a politician can say, hey, it did something for you. This incentivizes cronyism, and it goes beyond commercial zoning. Many malls were created as a co-venture between local governments and private companies that crafted sweetheart deals, from tax abatements to eminent domain and infrastructure upgrades. This year, the $5 million American Dream Mall in New Jersey is set to open in October after over a decade of delays, budget overruns, and negotiations. And in Arlington, Virginia, the Boston Common Mall is getting redeveloped with $10 million in public infrastructure updates and $45 million in tax increment financing. This is a result of the corporate mall's strong lobbying arms that can convince governments that they'll bring in revenue, jobs, and translate to public support. And that's something that the Main Street entrepreneurs can't do for benefits Main Street doesn't get to have. This isn't free market competition. This is cronyism. At the same time that governments are propping up malls, they're also propping up the mall's main competitors, online retail. Since 2012, Amazon alone has received $2.4 billion in tax subsidies, giving them an unfair advantage over their own malls, and certainly over small businesses and entrepreneurs on Main Street. Instead of allowing natural market competition to discover ways of creating wealth, these governments are attempting to prop up political favorites many of which are competing against each other, which counteracts their subsidies in the first place. This is how political favoritism destroys wealth. But would Main Street have emptied out due to big box stores regardless? It's a great question because we don't know. I mean, we don't know the counterfactual. Local governments plowed money. The traditional Main Street might have actually been displaced by new, you know, big box retail, or it might have you know, changed its ways and gradually over time responded to the changing realities of retail and survived. We see this brand new shiny mall, but what we don't see is that the main street that maybe the city government could have redone the sidewalks or planted trees. Maybe the city government could have given those small business owners tax breaks that would have helped them survive. And so there's this scene which is the brand new mall, but there's this unseen which is all these foregone opportunities to cultivate the local entrepreneurs who already exist. It's not just the opportunities on Main Street that we don't get to see. It's also the wildlife, swamps, forests, and marshes that were cleared out for the malls. And other times it was racially motivated. 
Under urban renewal, black communities and communities of color were often targets of property seizures, or they were split up by new highways, or declared blight so they could be demolished. It's a painful truth, but in so many cases, these city planners' urban ideals did not include non-white communities. And it's only made more painful now that those plans are beginning to fall apart. In the coming years, one third of malls are projected to close. Many retail jobs, oftentimes the biggest employers in most states, are coming to an end. We're looking at a lot of dead jobs and a lot of dead real estate. Why is that? The problem is the planning itself. In many malls, they face very stringent zoning, from how big their parking lots had to be, to the height of their building, to the goods and services that could be offered inside. Oftentimes, this forced the mall to only serve dry good retail, and that makes them particularly fragile because that's the exact kind of business that has shifted to e-commerce. Well, the mall now is a giant box surrounded by a large surface lot that you drive to. You walk inside and it's climate controlled and it's only shops. What a mall is going to be increasingly in the future is a mixture of shops and apartments and office spaces. Might be things like, you know, healthcare facilities, small breweries, things of this nature. You're already kind of seeing this in many parts of the country. So there's this new term which is called a lifestyle center, which is basically just that. It'll be a ground floor of retail, uh, open air, so it'll have sidewalks and a little street growing through it. Uh, almost like a sort of traditional downtown recreated. And then it'll have shops and, and apartments and offices also above. These lifestyle centers are becoming more and more of a reality, with open air spaces like the Grove in LA and urban markets like the Chelsea Market in New York. This vibrant mix of entrepreneurs and new innovative retail is on top of a large return to Main Street, where breweries, restaurants, bars, and experientials have made a massive comeback. I'm really optimistic in the near term. Uh, I think that many cities are looking at their tax rolls and they're saying the mall being closed can't be you know, the situation forever. We need to find some new way to use this land. You don't get sustainable economic development through these kinds of government managed cronyism. Sustainable economic development has to build up over time. It has to be real growth. It has to be people doing things more productively, new ideas coming to the table. You can't subsidize your way into this sort of long-term prosperity. A vibrant community comes from the desires and choices of the community. When planners decide to force those choices into zones, game the system for certain players, and fight change, it's not only unjust, it often ends in ruin for all of us.